Okay, hello everyone. Last day of DEF CON. Thank you a lot for coming and yeah, we hope this is like a fun workshop for everyone and we can actually get to see how this uh, technology works and you, you might be able to like run it on your own hopefully by the end. Um, yeah, do we want to introduce ourselves? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah sure. Um, hi, my name is Jennifer. I'm a software engineer at Course One. Um, Course One is a um, staking provider. Like we run validators on several, lots of different networks actually. But of course, the coolest one being Ethereum, and this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, Gabriela. Yeah, um, my name is Gabriela. I part of like the research team at Course One. Uh, I focus on Ethereum mainly, and yeah, definitely the coolest chain. They they want that merit. <laughs> So the the title of this is spin it off, uh, spin up all the data on testnet, and yeah, the the way I think we wanted to structure this is basically in the beginning I'm going to be giving you like an essential outlines of like the different parts that uh, we're going to be looking at when we all well, move to the second part, which is the demo. Uh, when Jennifer is going to actually demonstrate how to spin up this validator. And well, then I think you'll get the time to do it yourselves. Um, with the repo that we're going to be sharing with you, um, the information on like the Wi Fi is over there if you need it. And yeah, then maybe this kind of like we wanted to co-create it with you we can continue into like the steps on the validator so exiting the validator or we want to do like more bonus things that we think could be fun like going more into like the block explorers for the validator that you created and maybe like even understanding a little bit more like in either scan maybe like the different parts that we mentioned during the, the essential like a talk that i'm going to give so yeah I think uh, one thing I'd like to mention, like, feel free to, like, just uh, interrupt us, ask any questions. Um, this is your workshop, and this is why we also leave it kind of, like, very flexible for you, what kind of, like, exercises um, you want to do. Um, and then we'll see who's interested in exiting a validator. Um, we, we have some keys um, that you can use um, that we've already deposited. Um, so and they will only be available during this workshop. So if you want to play around, do it during the workshop. Um, after that, they won't be available anymore. All of these, of course, powered by Kurtzman, who Kurtzman. just gave us this, this key, uh, our company. So yeah, I think we're ready. Yeah, let's go into like, the essential like, talk that I want to give. Um, um, do we? Uh, let, let, let's get, yeah, let's get, give some context, actually. Oh, maybe right, about right. How yeah how this uh, workshop actually came about. Um, namely, the, yeah, the past few months, we were like working really hard um, on an API um, to automatically spin up validators. And I'm like, I'm super proud that we're like, this week we like released it, um, so I can publicly talk about it. Um, kind of my baby. So basically, obviously before you automate something, you have to do it all like manually. Um, so I found myself running like lots of Docker containers and like running validators um, just to test it. And with uh, Opus API, you can actually just um, call our API and it will um, spin up a validator automatically for you. Yeah, very cool. And yeah, we have like announcements on our Twitter and everything if you want to read more about it. But yeah, I think you're here to do the, the particular part. Let's chill in. So okay, let's go to to this. And yeah, I wanted to start with like kind of like a big picture look into like the Ethereum network. And well, Vitalik gave like this very good talk during the opening ceremony. But I guess I wanted to take a little bit from that and also make it like more pertinent to like the topic of staking and validators and what they do inside like the network that yeah, we are creating here, you know? So yeah. This is, again, uh, a quote by Vitalik, and I'm not going to read everything to you, but 
this is like a cool, I think, look into our uh, blockchain and the different parts that we are going to be seeing today are mentioned there. But I guess one of the most important parts to, I guess, speak out of this definition is when it says like, carries very strong crypto economically secure guarantee. And well, crypto economically is basically a made up word that we have here at crypto. But yeah, it has a lot of meaning specifically when it comes to like the security of the Ethereum network. It has two parts, the crypto, which makes you think of math and then like the economic part which makes you think of money and it's like math and money has a lot to do with like the things we do here but yeah and specifically like the role of validators here in the network so that is uh, essentially like the idea that we have behind these blockchains and there's like quite a few of a uh, very like interesting things that they can do for example for me I do find that like the guarantees that they have to continue running even if people like are not interested in them, that they are basically like infinite and they continue even like beyond, hopefully beyond the ages of everyone here present. Um, they have like very high availability, like uptime and everything that we try to keep here on the network. And basically all of these uh, blockchains that we kind of hear about, they're part of this cool they're part of this thing called like consensus protocols, right? And when we think about consensus, what we're basically talking about is trying to keep like a huge number of different computers in sync, even in front of like all of the challenges that you could find to keep like a number of distributed computers like always in sync, in sync which could be like network outages or even like a denial of service like attacks. Uh, we know of those here in, here in Ethereum, yes. But basically, when we try to think about like this definition, we are basically conflating like two different things or two things that are kind of conceptually different, uh, especially when it comes to like smart contract platforms like Ethereum. And for example, when you're running like an Ethereum full node, and yeah, by the end of this workshop, I hope everyone here is like capable of doing that then it is true that you're running like a consensus protocol. So on that side, you're working hard, like connecting to other nodes and trying to bring like a, all of them in sync, like I said. But at the same time, what you are staying in sync on is like this set of instructions. And these instructions are in themselves like updates to the state, the state of the machine that we are running, right? And these instructions could be like as simple as like transferring money to one side to the other. Uh, Ethereum is good at that, but also much more complex things. And well, I think this talk would have been better at the beginning of DevCon, but we've seen like so many of those applications uh, during the week, all the things that can be done, no? So if you're running like that full node in Ethereum, then you are also like responsible for like the compute and the computation of all this. Uh, instructions that we can on consensus of. And those are very two, like, two very distinct responsibilities that are worth, worth like, separating. And when we see that, well, what I'm talking about is obviously, like, the separation between what we call, like, the execution layer and the consensus layer in the protocol, no? That is, like, kind of, like, the main architecture behind the nodes that you'll be, you'll be developing. So we want to dive just a tiny bit deeper into these two things. Um, on one side, well, you can see the, the architecture there. But yeah, on one side, we have the consensus and this consensus mechanism. So you might be wondering, like, OK, how does Ethereum keep like this X number of validators uh, in sync? And well, nowadays, or by the time like I was preparing this presentation, then that number was like X correspondent to 441,747 active validators. But there is a world, right, where there could be like millions of these, or we hope that there's millions of nodes running. And we can actually like cap the amount of uh, nodes that the Ethereum network can handle. Because it is a function on like the total supply of Ethereum that is currently like on the network. 
But yeah, uh, to understand like a little bit more about the relationship between like supply and ETH, then I recommend like a talk that was given here called Ultrasound Money. I uh, won't go very deep into that, but yeah, to go back into our topic, uh, Ethereum today uses something that is called the Gaspers, Gasper Consensus Algorithm. Uh, the too long didn't read is that it's not really like a single algorithm that controls the network. It's like two different and very complex algorithms, one bringing like the block finality and the other bringing like a fourth choice. And I do love talking about this, so I will go a little bit deeper. I hope <laughs> I don't lose you. Um, let's see. Casper, FFE, is the name of the finality algorithm. So basically, and yeah, I want to relate it more to like the validating process. So during the block proposing process, like the one of basically randomly, like one of the validators of the whole set of validator, active validators that I mentioned, is selected from the pool. Uh, however, what is expected is that the network will grow like in a single blockchain, one block at a time, one by one. But sometimes the network, like I said, could fall out of sync and produce or broadcast or two block, uh, true validators might broadcast like two valid blocks that could be potentially added to the network. Uh, and when that happens, that creates something that is called a decision or like a fork. And even like small forks are very like existential threats to like the protocol or different distributed systems. <laughs> because there should always be like one true blockchain or one canonical blockchain. So Casper, the idea, and not going into detail, details, is to like give certainty to like this one true blockchain. And the fourth choice would be like, it's called LMD Ghost, uh, helps to complement this Casper protocol. And like I said, most of the time it grows one by one, but sometimes like the choice appears, okay, which one of these four choices should we choose? So this is like a function that takes like all the different paths that are in the chain and spits out like the one canonical chain that is going to be Ethereum. And together like both of, both of these things uh, try to keep like the network in sync at all times. I think that that's a pretty cool description. Um, going into like, uh, the execution part, like I mentioned. Uh, basically, uh, Ethereum is definitely more interested in like being a consensus protocol, and the EVM is interesting, but in my opinion, is uh, something that can be changed in the protocol. But yeah, uh, Ethereum exists in a network that has like thousands of uh, computers. And each of them is currently running like a local version of the Ethereum virtual machine. And basically the EVM is like the place where all of these decentralized computation happens, all the smart contracts and all the, trans the transactions that we know. And that is the place where all of those uh, contracts live. And this is the same environment. Like it doesn't matter what kind of computer you have or what kind of client you're running. It basically is like the same environment all across the network. Within the AVM, there lives like a number of entities that are called accounts and like contracts, objects, and the ETH, which uh, fuels like everything within, within the network. And basically what the AVM is, uh, has to do is basically follow like a set of rules. And the main rules there are that Everything should be recorded in blocks, everything that happens inside the ABM, and should be added to like the public blockchain. Anything recorded in the blockchain cannot be undone, and all objects should have like an owner, and they cannot be altered without the permission of the owner. This is very basic. Some of these, these things are changed depending on like different applications but, and different like things that are going in the protocol, but this is like the basic rules, I think. 
going pretty quickly in this, another thing interesting thing are like the different clients. So today in the workshop, we'll be using uh, two, I guess, minority clients. I mean, it's difficult to, to still say that Lighthouse is my minority, but yeah, we'll be, we'll be using that at some point. And also like Teku, Teku for, for what you've been doing, while, while you've been doing. And also in the execution side, we'll be using Besu, which yeah, uh, I think we could say is pretty min minority. And yeah, like we said, we have like this execution part and this consensus part, and we have execution clients and consensus clients. Uh, the execution clients will listen to the different transactions, they change the state of the EVM, and they hold like the current copy of, well, the state. And the consensus client, well, they keep all the machines in sync so that the proof of stake, uh, well, consensus algorithm can work, no? And well, Ethereum having like different implementations is actually like a great asset. I think we all know it. Um, and yeah, the important part there is keeping like each of these implementations under like a security threshold so that the network can stay online at all times. Um, yeah, I think we're all aware of the importance of client diversity. So yeah, we wanted to use minority clients today. So yeah, a little bit more into like the validation process. Uh, it's basically what it keeps uh, Ethereum secure now. And staking on Ethereum can take many views, but let's take like the more canonical like idea of what staking is. Uh, definitely a lot of changes going on in, the, in this industry, yeah. But okay, canonically, what it means to stake is to secure the Ethereum network by making a deposit, which has like a transaction of a financial bond, which is uh, 32 ETH, that you have to like deposit into like what is called the, the deposit contract of Ethereum. And the idea there is that if you validate transactions honestly, then you get like a certain payment. And if you are dis dishonest, dishonest, then you basically can you lose this bond. Because Ethereum does not have like a native delegation model, then you either go through like running your full node, or you could have like a few options. For example, like the most decentralized of the liquid staking solutions are probably better. And yeah, maybe other options that we don't want to encourage, okay, so. And yeah, going a little bit further into like those rewards and slashing conditions. Um, Basically, here I just want to quickly mention like the incentives and like the design solutions that the protocol has had, but like very quickly. So in the same sense that you have like an execution layer and a consensus layer, then you also have like execution rewards and consensus rewards. So the consensus rewards make like the biggest like piece of the pie of the rewards at Ethereum. And they basically come from like doing like the attestations and proposing the blocks. At the station means voting inside the system, okay? Uh, voting for the different blocks and voting for them to be included. And very rarely then producing blocks. I mean, you probably will be producing blocks, but it is kind of more random than doing like the attestations. And in the same way that you can earn those rewards, then uh, the exact amount that you earn is what is detracted from like your balance when you uh, are offline, for example, or you, you fall into like what's called the inactivity leak. And that isn't like really slashing. Slashing is a completely different thing. Um, hopefully today we'll have enough people to like try that and see if we can get a slash in, in, <laughs> in our testnet, just to see how it is. But yeah. And slashing can go like from like one ETH to losing like the complete bond. So the effort. 32 ETH of, that you have in your balance. And yes, finally, okay, you have a question. <coughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Basically, uh, this penalty that you can get usually comes from being online. And it is the exact amount that you would have earned in the same period, like you said, and like you said, 
uh, slashing come from things that directly attack like the consensus uh, of, of a theorem. So that is usually like either double signing, putting like the same keys on two different machines is very common. If you like forget, I don't know, probably shouldn't, it's money after all. And, and also like the basically trying to do like surround voting, which is difficult to explain, but basically you're trying to change like the canonical change to back, uh, like the historical data that has already been added to the blockchain in the future, but yeah. I can explain later if you want. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that the, the last thing I wanted to mention because it's very important for what we're going to do is, uh, yeah, you can pass that. I think mm -hmm. we talk about it. Keys and signatures. So today we will be actually going through like the process of generating keys and everything here in front of you. And keys and signatures are like the main crypto cryptographic like primitives that allow all the communication that is going on in the network. When you look at the most like base level, uh, you can definitely look into like the different block explorers and you see like all the different keys that are interacting with each other, all the contracts which also have like these uh, different signatures and everything. And yeah, hopefully we have the time to look that in, in the block explorer. And they work through something called hashing, um, <laughs> which is basically a cryptographic term. And it's more like a more efficient way to like securely store data inside of the blockchain, which is like the entire basis of the protocol, I think. And basically you have like this digital signature that represents like the validator and you get it from like a key generation algorithm that will we'll go through in here, like I said. And there's also like a signing algorithm and a verification algorithm that go behind like the scenes to to really verify that everything that is uh, getting added is well correct. Hopefully we have like the time to see all of those things. And yeah, I think, I hope this wasn't very boring to you. Like I think this may bird's eye view on what the protocol is. It's important to like understand what we'll be seeing. So yeah, I think it's time for, for the demo. Nice, okay. Then I'll take over. Um, and I will just work from this GitHub repo that you can try and find. Um, so basically the way I kind of thought um, might be helpful for you is like I'm gonna walk through the demo um, I would kind of like rec recommend you kind of then in the self-study time retrace my steps. You can just do the same and then, yeah, go on. Um, the Wi-Fi, I think it's best to connect to the DEF CON workshop one. Yeah, I think so. It's not working. It's, it's working for you. Okay. Are you are you guys okay with the internet? You think you're good? Okay, it's working on mine. <laughs> worst case, worst case, you can borrow my laptop. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Not my NFTs. Um, yeah, okay, what was I saying? Yes, um, I'm gonna walk through the demo. I think it would be best if you then kind of like retrace my steps. And then there's kind of uh, some exercises, like first we're gonna do light, uh, try the Lighthouse client, then you can try the Teco client yourself. And then uh, number three is like fairly challenging, but obviously if you're feeling adventurous, um, you can walk through uh, these steps too. And then I think we'll kind of like reconvene and then see what people are interested in. Either we like exit our validators or we um, I don't know, explore the block, but let's get, let's get into it. Um, go on. Okay, actually, let me just, let me just uh, kind of like describe the test, uh, the, the steps. Um, that's a gr brilliant pr question, actually. So generally, on a higher level, like what you need um, to actually like become a validator on Ethereum is you need to generate your keys, that's like step one. Um, you need to set up your infrastructure um, and then like make a deposit of like 32 ETH. We're gonna use test ETH, 
by the way. And then it takes a while for the uh, validator to be activated. Um, and because of kind of like we have to take a shortcut because also like girly if is like pretty uh, sparse. Um, and also like this like waiting for the validator to be active, I don't think it would be feasible um, in this workshop. So basically what I've done is um, I already generated keys um, for a testnet. And we, we do have like some of the infrastructure already kind of like set up. Um, we have like an execution client and a beacon node, which is already synced, provided by chorus one. And basically we will set up the validator client and connect to that. And this will be on testnet. So no like private net. Any more questions before I jump into the demo? <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> There's like a <laughs> seems like it's a market. It's a real market. <laughs> yeah, cool. We can do an auction later. All right. We sit down. Um, got this weird setup because my screen is broken, but this works actually really, really well. All right. Um, let's start. Ah, yeah. Steps. Step number one. What we want to do? We want to generate our keys. And the way I do this, um, actually, if like go, if you go into the repo, um, you want to open this link, which takes you to the staking deposit CLI. It's an open source project, but if you're in foundation, when you open the link, um, just download um, the, state, the, the CLI for your uh, operating system. Um, pro probably best if you just, I've already downloaded it, so you don't need to watch me um, do that. Um, so basically what the deposit CLI will generate, like two important artifacts. Um, number one is the information, it's called the deposit data, the information I need to make my deposit. And number two, actually probably the most important, it's going to generate your private signing key. So as like Gabriella was saying before, whenever a validator like basically does, makes any attestations or like proposes a block, they need to sign it. They need to sign them so they can be held accountable. Um, so is there anything else I want to say there? No. I'm just going to like run the CLI to show you what's, uh, how this works. Um, there's this command called new mnemonic, which will like generate a mnemonic for you. Um, anyone wants to know what a mnemonic is or is everyone aware? Um, basically, mnemonic is like um, a list of words you will see in a bit because it will generate it for me, um, which represent the seed. And from this kind of like seed, I can uh, generate my, my private keys. And the cool thing about this is that it's like deterministic. So the same mnemonic will always generate the same uh, key. So in case you lose your key, um, you need your mnemonic uh, to regenerate them. Okay, the CLI is asking me a few questions. I'm going to pick English. I'm going to pick English. I want to run one validator. Um, oh, yeah, of course. Does that work? Cool. Um, this is an important bit. Let's, uh, we're going to do this for girly testnet. Ah, yeah. And then uh, what the deposit CLI will do is, um, as I said, like generates uh, my private signing key and it will decrypt it. Um, and the file is kind of like called a key store file. So here, in this point, I'm gonna select a password, which I can then use to like um, encrypt my private signing key. I'm gonna type it in again. <coughs> ah, yeah, this is my mnemonic. This is the thing I was talking about. Um, need to copy it and put it somewhere. Don't show it to anyone. Um, and this. Um, Oh, cool. It's going to work fast. Um, so now it should have uh, generated my keys in here. Let's have a look. Um, the first thing is the deposit data. Um, as I said, like this is the information we need um, to activate our validator. Because when I generate my keys, no one knows that my keys exist, right? So actually, I need to um, submit this uh, information to the beacon chain and tell it to like, hey, this is my information. I want to become a validator, basically. Um, but I will go into this um, in the next step. I just wanted to show you what is generated here. Actually, let's look into the key store file. Um, 
So this is my uh, encrypted private signing key. It looks a bit scary, but actually if we decrypt it with the password that uh, I've typed in before, it would just be like classic uh, private key, not, not, not scary looking at all. Um, so yay, we generated our keys. Um, really like important things uh, just to remember. Actually the most important, if you remember anything from this section, like this is the private signing key and we're gonna use it later uh, to start our validator client. Go on. Okay. They use the same uh, hashing algorithm and yeah, the same, the, the keys and the accounts basically look the same. Like if we look at uh, the Explorer, you could see like they all start with like OX and because they use like the same hashing algorithm basically, yeah. No, because there are different like entities inside Ethereum. Like a wallet is recognized as like an account and this is recognized as like a key, okay? Next one, thanks. Um, where are we? Testing, 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 testing. Oh yeah, there it is. Um, any more questions? Because I'm gonna jump into the next step. Um, because now that we have a keys, um, the next thing I want to do is make it a deposit. Um, also, oh yeah, I've added so, like lots of like uh, reading material, so you can depth first search your way into uh, the demo. Um, if you if you want to make a deposit, um, the best thing to do is go to this like staking launchpad, um, and you're gonna walk. It's gonna take you through kind of like some questions. I'm not gonna do it all in front of you. Um, but it's actually, like if you wanna click through this, this actually gives us a really good information, like what, like about deposit, about uptime and general information. And once you get to the end of this checklist, um, it will ask you to um, upload the JSON file that we saw earlier, um, namely the deposit data. And then you connect with your wallet and um, if you're super lucky, you're 32 ETH and then you can just uh, make the deposit. Girly, mm. that's quite important actually, um, to use the correct uh, network. Um, okay, actually this is a um, um, pretty, pretty neat graph I found on the uh, prison documentation. Um, so again, as I said, like when we generate the keys, no one really knows about them. So we have to make a deposit, um, then kind of the validator comes into this deposited uh, state. Um, and it, in, in the end, it joins a queue um, this is actually by design. I can talk about this um, probably later on. Um, but then um, the most important thing is like it joins a queue and it takes a while from to become active. Um, and then as, a, as a Gabriella already said, like you, I mean, if you're a validator, like participating in, con in consensus and everything's going great, you're getting rewards. But it could also be that like your validator, I don't know, like you like make a mistake, validator misbehaves and then you would get slashed. And um, it could even uh, get to a point where you get forcefully exited from the network. Um, also, like if, you, um, if your validator has been like nine days active, then you can also voluntarily exit your validator. Although there's no, there's no turning back. If you exit your validator, it's done. Um, and at some point you will also, at some point after the Shanghai fork, we will also be able to finally withdraw our ETH. Okay, I think that's everything I wanted to say here. So we generated our keys, we made a deposit, and now we're actually ready to set up our infrastructure. Go on. No, it's fine. Can you repeat it? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, yeah, I, th I see your point, okay. I mean, in this workshop, I guess, we are showing you how to run your own nodes, so you will be your own staker. 
we do have, or there exists like liquid staking solutions because to be, to run your own node, you would need like 32 ETH, which yeah, it can be a limitation to some people. There are like other liquid staking solutions where they ask you either like a smaller bond or you can do like uh, just uh, deposit uh, the staking in, all, in a, a different protocol, deposit like I don't know, one if, if that's everything, all, all that you have, and you get the staking rewards without having to run your own, uh, your own validator, like at home, like the, the entire setup. And okay, yeah, then there's also other solutions. We have like this API that you can do these steps easier with. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess you, you can be a, a solo staker. You can stake with like a liquid staking solution or like a staking pool or yeah, stake with centralized entities. Sweet. Um, Gabriella actually gave like a really good uh, overview before of like the infrastructure involved. And I just wanna repeat that because I think it's like um, really, really important to note. Um, so what we need um, is we need our execution client, um, which is responsible obviously for executing the consensus. Um, we actually already have like, we will um, have a Bezel node uh, set up. Um, and then you also need the consensus client. And this uh, kind of consists of two parts. Um, it's like the beacon node, um, which connects to the P2P network, and then the validator client, which, um, which, which you're gonna run locally, which actually manages um, which, which, which manages the validators. Um, and again, here we had to take a shortcut um, because the, both the execution client and the beacon node, they actually take a while to sync. Um, I know there's like workarounds, but I still thought it's like easiest. We already connect to a uh, synced um, execution client, um, a Bezu node and a synced beacon node. Um, I believe that's a Teco node. Um, again, both... Uh, provided by Chorus One. Um, so I think the first thing um, we should do is just to make sure that the beacon node, uh, we can connect it. That would actually be tragic if not, but let's have a look. I was trying it before. So that's, that's okay, uh, seems, seems fine, we can connect it. Um, I, had a, I also like, included a link for like, the whole like, beacon node API. So if you're feeling like you want to explore like what the beacon node looks like, you can actually, um, again, in the demo, you see the, the URL from the beacon node that we provided and you can just play around and um, send some requests if you fancy it. Okay, so um, summary, we have, an we have a beacon node synced, connected to an execution client already synced. Um, so all we have to do um, is we pick a validator client. And the one um, I'm gonna show in a demo right now is Lighthouse. So Lighthouse is a validator client um, written in Rust. Um, they have really cool uh, documentation. Um, actually, I think, I think when I started looking into this, there were still fairly minorities. So they really caught up. <coughs> um, ah, yeah, okay. So we're gonna pick Lighthouse. And what you do is uh, you pull the Docker container, sorry. <coughs> Okay, I can talk again. Um, I've already, I've already like pulled the Docker uh, image, um, so let me just uh, try and see this if this works. Yeah, so you don't have to watch me uh, download a Docker image. Um, and once we have this set up, actually let let me now jump into VS Code because it's gonna be um, much easier, I think, to show you um, all this configuration. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into demo and then Lighthouse config. Um, and Lighthouse has like a neat thing, um, this validation, val validator definitions YAML, where you can um, configure all the validators you wanna run in this uh, client instance. And I'm just gonna walk you through this. Um, so you can actually like run multiple, um, mu multiple validators in uh, one instance. And you can like, here's a flag to enable or disable um, here comes the voting public key. Um, you, like, that would be from the key that we like, generated. Um, so here you basically wanna say, okay, I'm running this validator and this is how it will kind of identify you. Um, 
since the merge, we also like uh, have to um, or want to um, configure a suggested like a fee recipient. Um, yeah, actually, look, let me go into this. So um, before proof of work, um, the miners would like receive some kind of tip um, in the transaction when you put them in a block. And now with um, now after the merge, actually these kind of tips go to the validators. Um, so with the fee recipient, you just kind of like um, specify which address this should uh, be sent to. I just put a burner address uh, in there because if I don't, uh, Lighthouse will like start complaining and logging uh, some warnings. <clears throat> oh yeah, and then actually most importantly here, we actually wanna configure our keys now that we've generated before. Um, there's other ways to configure them. Um, just for simplicity, um, we're gonna go for lo local key store. Um, and then you just kind of um, show the voting key store path. To, so basically, um, remember um, our, the key store, our encrypted private signing key. Um, this is where you point to. So you point uh, Lighthouse to the path, and then you give it the decryption password um, because obviously it needs a signing key to like sign whatever attestations you make. Um, so this is all the configuration. Um, just to show you here um, is my voting key store. Um, and Lighthouse is, just want to mention this, Lighthouse is very opinionated about how you name kind of these uh, folders and files. So if you run into errors, then it could also just be like, maybe you had like a typo in the name or something. Um, but now I have, any questions? Yeah. Oh, um, so basically what, what, I, what I meant is like, I could actually have like two or three validators just in this client instance uh, running. Yeah, I think it's important to say you have to have like one execution client connected to one beacon client, okay? But inside the beacon client, you could have uh, several validators. It's like a one-on-one, -on -one, one-to-one -one relationship between the beacon client and the execution client, but many validators and it's fine. Um, audible, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, any of those works. As long as you're having like a one-to-one -on -one, one -one relationship between the beacon and the execution part. Thanks for mentioning that. That's yeah, actually it's actually important. Thanks. Cool. Any more questions? Um, I mean, the idea there is to have like more of an opportunity, I guess, to earn like the rewards and propose more blocks. And I guess on the other side, like to keep like more secure the network, like the amount of validators uh, is like a measure of security, I guess. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that is what I meant when I said that uh, this is like the canonical way of running it, but there are a lot of things going on in like the staking like part of the world. Well, like she said, if you want to learn more about distributed validators, go ahead. We had several great talks about it here at DevCon. Yeah, we actually had a conversation about it yesterday. So it, it, it didn't take too long for someone to bring up distributed validators. I like it. <laughs> um, okay, I mean, keep the questions coming. Um, it's really important. So now like we finished the configuration of our Lighthouse client, um, we can actually jump into like running our Docker container. Um, so basically I, I need to, um, you know, do, do Docker run, I expose the port, um, and then I mount, um, I mount my configuration into the Docker image. So it's accessible within, um, within Docker. And then here, this command is fairly important, like validator client, because Lighthouse offers, um, it actually offers also to run the beacon node and the validator client in one process. Um, but here, obviously, we want to kind of like split it up, run it separately, because we, we want to connect to a synced beacon node. Um, Lighthouse also has this like um, argument in its session protection, 
So what it will do is um, it will kind of like set, set up a slashing protection database. Um, I, what I have to point out though is that this only works within your client that you have running. So if you have like two Lighthouse clients running, then this uh, slashing protection, this internal one doesn't help you. Um, we specify the network. Um, we specify the beacon node that we want to connect to. And then I need just this uh, validator steer uh, argument to tell it, okay, this is where my configuration lives. Um, so then, let me see, I'm pretty sure I've done this before. Let's see if I have this command in my history so I don't have to type it all in. Um, this looks good actually from my point of view. So I'm gonna try and run this um, and hope it works. Okay, so what's interesting here in the logs, okay, yeah, we wanna run this for Prata, that's really important. Um, oh, well, now it's going quick. Um, this is my, yeah, it found an enabled validator in my configuration. Um, this is the voting public key. We can quickly check if that's true. Yeah, exactly, this is the one we configured. Um, what else is interesting? Ah, yeah, this is really important. It connected to the beacon node. Um, if the beacon node wasn't synced, then you would see this in here. Um, it would tell you like the beacon node is out of sync. Um, and now, yes, this is also very good news. So the validator that are uh, running, that are running is um, known to the beacon chain. So that means we actually made the deposit already and it's active. Um, Yay, and this is our validator running. Um, now to show you kind of like a proof of this, um, we're gonna go to Beacon Chain, um, probably like the, one of the very famous uh, tools to kind of like analyze your validators. Um, I'm gonna copy paste my public key. And now, okay, now it shows me some information. Um, here you can actually see like the, the statuses I was talking about. Um, so when we made the deposit, um, it was in the deposited state. Then when it was like queuing, it was like in a pending state and now it's active. And the reason why it's red was, is because um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, the key wasn't running anywhere. So I only just started uh, the validator client with this, um, with this key. Um, and this is why it's uh, leaking. So if you're, if, if you're like, like this is why validator uptime is so important because if you don't ensure that your validator is like running, you will lose some of your deposits. Yeah, I think you can show in like the attestations. Yes, exactly. Um, you would see that we were missing attestations because we were offline. Oh, look, it already attested. Oh, we already attested <laughs> once. Okay, <laughs> since, since it started running. But yeah, you can see we had like a lot of missing attestations because yeah. we were offline. But yeah, cool. Uh, that worked out perfectly. We are <laughs> testing. Um, is there anything else interesting we can show in here? Um, maybe? Can you? Mm, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, question. Can you pass him the microphone, please? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, since you guys had asked um, anything interesting, so one thing that we um, uh, have been paying more attention to, I guess most validators probably will pay to it, attention to it to some degree, mm -hmm. is the effectiveness rating. Um, I don't know if you guys have already um, talked about that, okay. but that can affect the um, the degree to which you uh, receive like the full amount of a reward for a testing or producing a block. Um, just yes. kind of measures how like the latency or how late you are in terms of being able to test. Um, I, yeah, I that is like you your ranking well. in the network, yeah. yeah. I can't see what it is right now because I'm like kind of blind, but... Uh, what is it? Let me see. It Almost should be at the top. Yeah. yeah. Effective. Oh. Effectiveness rating. Okay, yeah. I think it's 90%. No? Is it this one? No. No. 50. 50. Effective. 32. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, I actually don't see it. Where? We can we can look for it. Maybe we'll find it. Yeah, um, give us a minute and we'll find it. Yeah. Um, but I think this is like this kind of concludes the demo. 
Um, if you want to kind of clone the repo. No, 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 no. Absolutely, don't be sorry. Actually, this is what a workshop is for. Like, if you want to interrupt us, absolutely. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I forgot to mention also something that is kind of important when I mentioned like uh, the four choice rule when I went into that point. So basically what you're attesting to is the blocks. So you propose the block very rarely, but everyone should be attesting to like the blocks. Probably all the time, like you would want to have like a 100% attestation rate. Like it's a little bit common in and now in proof of stake, uh, it is like the, the analytics show that it is a little bit more common to, to miss attestations. But yeah, you should be attesting uh, each block and voting. And the reason I mentioned like the fourth choice rule is because Ethereum is, has this rule of not like, for example, something like Bitcoin, which is like the longest chain, but it is the chain with the most weight. And the weight is measured in attestations. So for example, if you had like, a different choice between like two forks and one of them then waits more like has more attestations uh, added or yeah they're like cryptographically added i guess uh, then that is the chain that it would choose uh you is there a way to withdraw the stake and rewards or is that also locked till the shanghai update yeah so like i mentioned there's two kind of rewards, like the execution rewards, you get them in your wallet and you can with, withdraw them like immediately from the fee recipient address that you, you decide. So those comes from like the different like transactions. So e the transactions that you add inside the block, they have like a tip and you get those those tips. And also maybe something more complex like MEV, like that also goes into that. And then the consensus one are the ones that are locked and cannot be moved. And those are added to like the balance. So for example, you can see there, can you see? Yeah, the balance says like 32 point something if what you, what you added, what you deposited is, is 32. So you already earned something there, but you cannot move it yet. And eventually when withdrawals are enabled, there will be like probably two options, like do like the full withdrawal, so like, all of the, all of the basically ETH that you have, or like just a remain, like what is above 32, because you should always have like the 32, okay? To specify, so the wallet address you entered earlier, where mm -hmm. you had it in the editor, that's mm -hmm. the one where it received the- You will the, receive the execution rewards right. there, yeah. And, and you can move the it. frequency, how often they're paid out? I mean, it really depends because it is like, determined by when you uh, propose a block, and that is basically random, so very hard to, I mean, you could like analytically say that, for example, you propose a block like once a year or something, but yeah, that would be like a curve, like yeah, you, you propose basically randomly, randomly okay. chosen. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, okay, you. <laughs> okay you first Sorry. and then you, okay. okay. Um, because you have the microphone. Question. At one point you said like the, you were mentioning the difference between like the Beacon node and the validator, the validator client. Mm -hmm. um, you do need a validator client to like uh, sync with the rest of the, of the, of the consensus uh, B2B, right? Yeah, the, the client needs to be connected to the Beacon node, yeah. And this is what um, I actually configured when I, let me show the command again. When you went to the YAML. Uh, yeah, no. Actually, when I started the Docker container, um, I had to specify the beacon node that I want to connect to. And let me, if I can pull this up again, I can show you. Um, and this is really important because other, like, if we don't have this, the validator client can't can't run. So um, it's actually this bit where I specify the beacon nodes, um, and otherwise you wouldn't be able to start. And, but yeah. I, I mean, could you have like one beacon node and run like different validator clients inside it? Yeah, you can connect uh, multiple validator clients to one beacon node. Okay. Yeah, I think most clients allow for that. But yeah, definitely check the documentation. But I think most of them allow for a different beacon chain and a beacon uh, validator client. Yeah. But, uh, at this point, uh, like, uh, 
doing this workshop, we mm -hmm. didn't spin up the, like the big or not like you had it beforehand. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, because because it just takes yeah, a while takes, to sync. It takes exactly, a while. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Always. Um. So two points. I, I believe you were asking about syncing, right? Between, so I think the execution client and the consensus client need to be synced, but like the validator client need, be, need to be connected, yeah. right? Not Cor yeah. Yeah. And the second thing uh, regarding attestation. Yeah. Sorry, and to add to that, yeah, they are synced because they are the parts that are actually connected to the peer-to-peer -peer networks. So they have to sync to all the blocks. Just to add. And regarding attestation, as to what I know, each validator need to attest once each each epoch, right? Like each 32 each, slots. Each slot, yeah. Each 32 slots, the validator has to attest only once, mm -hmm. right? Each epoch, you say? Yeah. I think, well, I think that they have these things called committees. And yeah, basically, yeah, to get a little bit more complicated, yeah. 128 uh, validators are chosen each slot to attest. And these committees are like rotating, so they rotate between all. Because it would be, it would actually, it is already kind of hard to, to reach consensus in time with the amount of validators that exist. So there needs to be like uh, other models to like aggregate the different signatures. And one of them is like the sync committees that it, uh, it is what she's mentioning, yeah. You are right. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I just got a quick question. <coughs> quick question. Uh, where's the execution client running? I mean, is it running with the together with the beacon node uh, in the setup? Or? Yeah, like the the execution client um, we have um, we have running um, somewhere. You you wouldn't you wouldn't see it because like the beacon node is um, connected to this execu execution client. And a beacon node is basically what we make available here. Yeah. Okay, it is running on Chorus One. <laughs> yes, exactly, Chorus One infrastructure. Thank you. I think you can show him the the picture in the slide, so they can have like the full full look at the architecture this of one, a right. node. That is what a node looks like. Okay, like a full node. You have the beacon node, the execution engine. They connect. They talk to each other. So we um, have, yeah, we have both of them currently running on course infrastructure, and we just connect to the beacon node with the validator client. You would be then talking about things like la latency, for example, if they are like two separate, you could fall into a situation where they don't communicate in time. So when you are like trying to, I don't know, propose a block and you go into the consensus, you missed a slot. Um, it definitely would depend on like the capabilities of your machine to do so. Um, but yeah, you definitely have to like take into consideration like things like latency and uh, yeah, the, the capabilities. I think actually uh, also one point, um, let me go back to this, uh, how to run this uh, Docker command. <clears throat> you can actually uh, connect to multiple beacon nodes, and this is sometimes uh, recommended um, just to have some some kind of like failover to make sure you're like connected, definitely connected to a beacon node. That was nice. That was like really nice uh, questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, what were, what were we gonna do? I think. I think so. Yeah. Actually, oh, maybe maybe one point um, that might trigger some conversation. Um, maybe like having walked through this demo, maybe you're noticing some kind of like limitations um, with this like setup. Um, a few of them kind of um, I think are obvious. Like we we have you know we like configured the local key storage can be maybe a bit dangerous if you just have like your, your key stored locally with the decryption password. Um, what you could do um, to kind of like improve this, you could actually store them in Vault. <clears throat> in that case, uh, they're all also usually backed up. Um, also, because we're just running like one validator client, um, we are really dependent on the Lighthouse software. And this is exactly what uh, Gabriella showed before. Um, we saw this actually with, with um, Prism like a few months ago, like they had like 
a lot of validator clients were like, like prison was kind of like represented. And the problem is just like, if there is really like a bug in the software, um, it's just, it can be become really tragic for, for Ethereum, for the network, because it could be that like the, the, the chain can't finalize. And this is why it, um, client diversity is so important. Um, just so if, if there's any errors, uh, the network can survive. And then um, something you can explore in the, in the exercises is um, I already talked about the session protection that Lighthouse has. <clears throat> if, you, if you're actually running like multiple instances or multiple clients, this won't uh, serve you. Um, so there's one exercise if you like, again, if you're feeling adventurous, uh, you can actually use a remote signer. Um, and if you have like multiple clients, you connect the remote signer that would um, um, also enable like slashing protection. Yeah. You just mentioned the like the key management part. Mm -hmm. um, if you could elaborate a little bit on like what you see um, people actually do with their keys. Um, and like the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is, the, from what I understood, is basically these two JSON files, uh, it's all you would, would you need in case your computer that you're running a node will be stolen or burns down or whatever. Um, so it's really, as long as you have those two files, the hardware doesn't really matter. Is that correct? Um, you mean like the deposit data and the key store JSON, right? Yeah, these two ah, okay. JSON files. So the deposit data is essentially, you just um, basically need it kind of like to make the deposit. Um, and the keys, um, as long as you have your mnemonic, you can regenerate them, that's true. So if, you, if your like, hardware is broken, then keep your mnemonic and you can regenerate from, from there. And then spin up the node again, because exactly, as long yeah. as it's offline, you can <laughs> spin it up again yeah. and then you should be good. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And on your first question, one of the things that I guess it's not an issue, but it is important to note is that you always need to have like your private key online. So you cannot have it like offline, like store securely in like a vault. You need to keep it like online so that they, they actually, uh, the network can connect and you can actually sign. But uh, like she said, there's these solutions like the remote signer and yeah, other like different kinds of solutions where you can have it like remotely or stored somewhere or yeah, they, there are like a lot of things you can do in terms of like key management and it is definitely important. I mean, I've known of people who have like their key <laughs> freely on their computer, like just signing like that. And yeah, it's definitely like a security risk, even if you do have to keep it online at, at all times. Okay, thanks again so much for the questions. Go on. <laughs> So um, piggybacking on what you were just saying about uh, like uh, best key practices, like is this, um, uh, where could we like, uh, do you recommend any sources where we could read more about this and uh, like those uh, best practices, security? I'll find those out for you and send okay. them, yeah. Thank you. There's and like, there's one section here um, which goes into like uh, remote signers. Yep. Um, and if you like open this up, like one example that I give is um, Web3 Signer, which mm -hmm. is fairly like, it's um, a kind of a famous product actually. So if you go into this link, um, there's also like good documentation because with, um, with this remote signer, um, I don't want to go too much into it because like you can like uh, read through this like now, um, but there you can, I think it supports um, storing your keys on either HSM or in the vault um, or locally. Okay, and um, let's say that for some reason, like those keys were compromised. Uh, is there anything I can do or I got wrecked? What do you mean compromised? Uh, compromised as in uh, someone- You gave them to someone, please don't. <laughs> no, uh, like I connected my uh, laptop to the HDMI of the New York uh, <laughs> Times Square screen. You connected the same computer where you're storing your keys on the, no, no please like, don't. Let's see, uh, I don't know, like everyone in Japan had, the, had those keys. Like they are completely compromised. Yeah, what I mean, if I they're go? compromised, I'm sorry, you just got wrecked, yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
last question was, now that we went through all of these, like this is uh, the manual setup, right? Let's say I have my mm -hmm. own hardware. I set this up myself. What are like the pros and cons versus using something mm -hmm. like uh, Stereum or Dabnode or any other like uh, simple UI, let's say? I mean, yeah, the solutions are pretty cool. Like they already come with like the pre-installed software so you, you don't actually have to do like anything of these that I've just shown you. And yeah, it's, I, I personally think that they are good solutions for like first time stakers or anything. But yeah, I think you get a lot more customization through your setup uh, by doing it yourself and configuring everything. And yeah, that gives you like a lot more flexibility into what you can do with it, with the with the node. Yeah. Also, I mean, the purpose of this is really to like share the knowledge um, because um, this this trend, I think this trend is like good to like make sure like some like a lot of people can run nodes, but they also oversimplify. Um, which can also be a bit dangerous. Um, so I think it's like definitely worth worth learning, worth understanding like the underlying kind of infrastructure. Um, and with this, if we if like more people actually customize their setup, then we would have more diversity. Because uh, why we end up with no diversity is because everyone runs the same product and they run the same nodes. Um, I would say on like the key management stuff, like at Coinbase, what we would do is we would import the key into like an in-memory embedded database, so that way you don't have to have it like you don't have to store it like um, on your disk. So you could import it from like a vault, like I don't know, like HashiCorp or something like that. Mm -hmm. If you set up the remote signer with Web3 stuff that Consensus has, you need to set up a, a Postgres database. Um, one of the ways that they manage risk around key, like let's say you, you lose your key. Um, what they would do is that we have pre-signed messages with uh, the ability to exit. So like if things got compromised, you would have a pre-signed message, message that you can just submit to the, the smart contract to exit. So you could also take that approach. Yeah, that is a good approach. I think it's always like a good thing to have like a database when you uh, store what is happening with your node. So uh, I think these these are the signer keys, right? That is separate from the withdrawal key. Correct. Yeah. So so the risk that he would have if his keys were compromised is someone double signing and then at risk at uh, being slashed. Okay, that part I have correct. Yeah. What would the withdrawal? I know it's not available yet. Yeah. But what would the withdrawal process look like when we're ready to withdraw some of our? That's an keys? excellent question. I mean, that is to be specified by uh, the Ethereum Foundation. And yeah, they did like this whole discussion. I think it was day one or day two, where they went into like the different possibilities for specifying that. But yeah, that spec is not ready yet. <laughs> uh, waiting, waiting. Um, any more questions? Honestly, I'm really, I'm really enjoying this. Um, it's been really nice conversations. Um, I guess the, the idea, like if you go to the repo and you unzip this key stores, um, we have like 16 keys pre-generated, already deposited and active. Um, I would say you just choose randomly whatever, which one you like. And then if we're really lucky, maybe we get um, slashed. I think it would be like that. that the, the worst thing that could happen is that we get like slashed heavily um, because you're using probably people will use um, the same keys. Um, but I think that would be quite exciting to explore, actually. And you all have these, right? Like, you all have access to it? Everyone has access to the repo. Um, then, again, uh, unzip the key stores, and you can pick one of them, um, which you can run. You can run a demo and just continue. If you have any questions, just uh, give me a shout. Um, happy to help. I think, I think, okay, you have a question. Okay, yeah. But this is like the time for you to like 
do what we just show you and see what happens. Like anything could happen right now. Yeah. Uh, so you didn't cover it specifically, but you mentioned you showed the like set up your own validator demo uh, site that they have set up. Mm -hmm. I was going through that, and it was everything was going fine, and then I saw that they wanted me to like uh, do port routing on my home router which was like opening ports on my computer to the general internet, mm -hmm. and that freaked me out. I <laughs> wasn't comfortable with that. Um, is that necessary to, to Wait, be a Why did you say was that? Sorry? Um, in the, in the um, not yours, but the, like how to set up your own validator website. And this says staking launchpad, you yes. mean when you click through it. That. Ah, yeah. So in, in <laughs> that, one of the steps is to go into your like home router and open ports on your computer to the general internet, and is it? Um, so the only way is it somewhere? Here? The only way where this uh, kind of like would make sense is like for the for the um, beacon nodes to sync, because mm -hmm. um, usually what they do is, um, I mean, either like you configure it that you have like checkpoints, but usually they like really like try to like you know find other like nodes to it, kind it of experiment. Makes it easier for them to find more peers. Yeah. Okay. I'll say so. Okay, but it is not so. There it is, the third check. I forwarded the necessary ports to the correct machines. So, uh, I guess yeah. So it's not necessary to become a validator. It just makes it easier to find peers. Um. I mean, to be honest, like now I'm not so confident. No, anymore. I think that it's means like opening the ports <laughs> for like the connection between the EL and the CL, like between themselves. Does it sense like connecting to the internet? Yeah. I don't see it. Okay, so if that I am if like I'm I running do. my EL and CL <laughs> on the same computer, then that is not necessary. That would make sense because then you don't have to open the port, right? Right. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Okay, only for. Okay, okay him. Oh, can you answer the question? <laughs> yeah, okay. He has the answer. Let's see. Yeah, so um, <laughs> it's not technically necessary, but um, mm -hmm. we've run many different types of nodes over the years, and you will fall behind in synchronization. Yeah. So uh, it's 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 uh, meant for uh, simply that that the peer to peer network works. You need lots and lots of connections, and if you don't have any incoming port, it means you will have outgoing connections that will bootstrap and you will sync the chain at some point, but. Um, it, the, the incoming connection uh, pools is uh, like a scarce resource on the network. And mm -hmm. the longer you stay online, you sometimes get blacklisted by other nodes. And there are many different things that can happen. So usually what happens is that you see like you have uh, start with eight connections. And then it goes down, down, down. And you have one. And then you have maybe zero. Then it tries to <laughs> trap again. And then you fall behind. And then you will miss some attestation. So it will perform worse. Um, and uh, I don't think it's uh, uh, that uh, critical. I think the most, yeah, the free, O free, O free, um, mm -hmm. that is the most uh, important one to have opened. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, um, that is the majority of the data that needs to get pushed through. The other ones, yeah. uh, the 9,000, is uh, sort of. Less, I, I'm not sure. I always open both, but I think the free or free or free is the most important one. Good yeah, answer. So like yeah. Thanks so much. That, like it's that's exactly right. Those peer-to-peer -peer ports are necessary for finding other beacons to communicate to. Yeah. You need those to broadcast your messages, and then also like you know to sync as well. And um, the way that like communication happens through your clients is like it's it's going to reject something that doesn't match the spec. So like, you know, even Coinbase has those ports open. So like, you should feel comfortable having them exposed. <laughs> yeah. I get your concern, but yeah, I think. Maybe yeah. let's start talking about network configuration. <laughs> if, you are, if you are in a hosted environment, okay. what you absolutely must do is set up a local firewall um, for outgoing connections, okay? Because if you are in any sort of Hetzna or AWS or other environment that monitors for a network attacks, you will get your service contract canceled if you just leave it open like that. Because in the in the payload of the peer-to-peer -peer network, people are injecting weird stuff like uh, not not uh, not assigned IP addresses and so on. Your node will try to connect to those, mm -hmm. and that will be seen as an attack. And actually, mm -hmm. uh, I had to do that multiple times to restore my service contract with them. So. <laughs>
this guy runs nodes. Yeah. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I invited him to the talk. <laughs> I couldn't answer, answer any questions. Thanks so much. Sweet. So to continue One what second. was being said about the ports, I'm actually a lighthouse developer mm. and I handle networking. So the thing is that when you start your node, you connect to some peers, mm -hmm. but on time, you're going to be dropped because they're going to prefer some other peers, or I know maybe they're going offline, it doesn't matter. You need incoming connections. And since in networking, we are forwarding, let's say like information about one peer to other peers so that they can connect between themselves, um, it's likely that your information, if you don't have ports open, it's not going to be forwarded to other peers. And even if it is because, I don't know, maybe it's wrong, and you are claiming to be reachable from the outside, they're going to try to reach you, and it's going to fail. Um, so yeah, it actually makes you vulnerable to attacks, not having ports open in that way, because you need to have peer diversity. Exactly. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Nice to see a lot of developers. Yeah, cool. Who is trying? Like, who is doing it to see? You, you. Nice. Are you guys trying? Sweet. Do you find it difficult or what is going to be? Or you have, have a question. Okay, we have a question, sorry. <laughs> is there some place, you know, I know for the shortcut, you didn't show how to do the execution client and the Hi. beacon node. Mm -hmm. Is there some place where um, I could see that that part of the process? Like, do you, did you make a video of it by chance? Or? Oh, like how we set up the execution client? Yeah, I would like um, to see that. No, no. sorry. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Layer clients, they have um, documentation on how to go through the entire flow of setting up the execution layer, um, um, as well as consensus layer client. So, I mean, in case yeah. you're trying to find a reference. Lots um, of also, like Coin Cashew, there's a bunch of resources on. Well, um, so you, you wanted some more information about slashing, is that? The two main things that, well, the two really big rules uh, you have to follow are no, like you said, a double signing. So if you have like a, these a keys running on a certain infrastructure, make sure to exit that infrastructure before you decide to deploy it somewhere else. And the second one is called uh, surrounded voting. And this is like an attack uh, tactic uh, towards like trying to change like the historical data in, in Ethereum, basically trying to change the past of the network. Yeah? And those are regarded as like attacks on the consensus, like they, they affect that part. So that is why they are like regarded as slashing conditions. I mean, you can have that. Uh, you can set up like a, do we have like a database for like? Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the slashing database basically kind of like records who's currently um, um, proposing. And um, also like with this uh, web free sign up product, um, if you have like multiple instances of it running, it would usually like connect to like one kind of like global uh, database. And by, da like by database l locking, um, it will always kind of like update like who's currently um, like, you know, signing which are the stations um, to avoid uh, double signing. So like if one key is like currently like doing something, then a second key, like actually the same key running somewhere else can't uh, access it. Sorry? A small, no, I mean,
I guess, yeah. I mean, it's like, this is like how you like, you know, record the state and make sure like, kind of like lock someone else's um, to like, make sure that you have like a concurrent process. <clears throat> um, yeah, so we mostly pretty much 100% tested and, and operated with running um, uh, the same client type for both the beacon and the validator node. Um, have you guys tested running like a prism validator against like a lighthouse beacon node? Um, those different combinations. I know the EF Foundation. Um, yeah. They they have they test different combinations, but mainly between the execution layer clients and the consensus layer clients, not between the two execution layer client components. Yeah, like um, yeah, we totally we totally tested that. I think we we still. Um, I've heard from a few clients like still preference um, to like uh, kind of like Black House Beacon Node with Lighthouse Client. Um, sometimes we like just to ensure kind of like uptime, um, you wanna configure multiple beacon nodes um, and there like you have the option. Like generally, like so far it's worked, it's worked fine. Actually, I think um, I'm pretty sure that this beacon node is a Teco beacon node and we just connected to it with a Lighthouse client. Um, so that's, that's one test we run just now. Um, to the ones that are trying, if you go into any errors or you find something cool to show, definitely share. Maybe now it's time to start some elevator music, some <laughs> launch background. So they, they play music at some of these, these things. Yeah, like this, exactly. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And to everyone, <coughs> thank, thanks a lot for coming. I hope this was like really informative. Uh, we definitely want to, you know, promote everyone that if you, it's possible to run, run a node, you don't even have to run like a validator node. You can also run like just a a uh, full node without that does not validate uh, and those just keep like the consensus going so yeah i think that is possible even if you don't have like the 32 so yeah <laughs> <laughs>